Hello everybody, this is Jed Mashu back for another edition of what has previously been known as the Fist Fight Fan Club, and that working title may not be carried forward uh, in the near future. We'll see how that plays out. But for now, uh, it's good to be back. This week I am joined by an associate editor for BloodyElbow.com, uh, a writer for Sports on Earth. Uh, you write for like a million other places. Uh, Kareem Zidane. Tell, tell the people where all you write for, because it's Sports on Earth, your own website, Sports Politica, uh, Open Democracy, I think you contribute. Where, where are you writing these days? Yeah, so you've named all the ones that I am contributing to, and until uh, the bylines actually show up on other websites that I've actually uh, have working articles for right now, or articles in progress, let's not mention them now, but uh, if you interview me a couple months from now, I might be adding a couple more outlets to that. I just... <laughs> Just a working man you are. Uh, for those who do not know, Kareem is, in my opinion, the foremost investigative journalist working in the mixed martial arts sphere. Um, and he is also a good friend of mine and one of, if not the single biggest reason I th currently have a thing for you to listen to. Uh, some brief backstory here. Kareem had a website, uh, theflyingkneemma.com. Uh, how many years ago was that, Kareem? I started that sometime in 2011, I think. That's when I got into MMA. It was 2011. I mean, I had started watching in 2009 when I moved to Canada and was in university here. But uh, yeah, it was 2011 when I decided I want to get into writing. And uh, I'm glad that he did because he, uh, he started a website and through fate and chance, I ended up uh, working for him for a little while and everything kind of spun out from there. So it is good to have my old friend on to discuss topics of MMA and also good because he is, like I said, the foremost investigative journalist specializing in general, uh, as far as the MMA sphere goes, in the intersection of sports and politics and I mean, for the most part, a lot of it has has resolved, revolved around this sort of caucus region, Russian, uh, in, I don't want to say insurgents, but influx of fighters that have come to the sport. Uh, Kareem, tell, tell the people how you sort of got into that space. Well, first of all, thanks. Uh, and I really appreciate that, Jed, for your kind words, even though I, I can't say I agree with, with most of what you said. I'm convinced that you would have gotten where you are, whether or not... Uh, uh, you had joined the Flying Knee MMA or not, or you had met me that that, that one time back in the day. But uh, it is great that uh, things go come around in full circle, and here we are today having this conversation. But uh, back to answer your question, I'm not quite sure. I think this this uh, niche I sort of I'm in a match right now. This intersection of sports and politics is a gradual thing. It really wasn't something that suddenly it was or was ever my intention from the very beginning when I started writing. When, it was, when people still ask me what my favorite thing to do is, I tell them I'm a storyteller first and foremost. And that's, uh, that's what I find most important. That's what, that's what I want to do the most is, is creative writing and telling stories that people don't expect and showing just how significant and impactful things outside of the sporting environment, outside of a football pitch, outside of a stadium or, or a basketball court or... In our case, a lot of the time, the octagon or a ring in general, there's a lot going on out there that is significant to what we're witnessing inside the, the cage. And over time, I started getting, I started doing long forms on uh, fighters in Russia. And that occurred when I, I was in St. Petersburg for an M1 show for the first time. I did commentary. I ended up uh, hooking up with M1 and doing uh, the, the, for many fans, the notorious promotion that, uh, allegedly kept Fedor from signing from the UFC, but as we've come to discover since 2015, is not exactly the, the case at all. But uh, yes, I had ended up doing commentary for them back in 2014 in St. Petersburg. And on my way to the arena, I happened to be on a bus full of Chechen fighters from the uh, absolute uh, championship Burkut promotion, the ACB promotion, which is actually doing very well for themselves right now. They were co-promoting that event with uh, M1 Global. And I commentated the fights that night and I got to spend a lot of time with these fighters and I thought it was fascinating. As someone who at the time didn't know much about Russia, being able to sit on a bus with fighters with seemingly Arabic names who were Muslim, who were not the Slavic Russian that you've come to expect from seeing movies and, and meeting uh, 
the the many many white Russians that you'll generally find. But uh, witnessing that, it, 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 it basically it made me very curious, and I felt the need to to look into it a little bit more. And I started researching a lot of these fighters and the backstory and picking up books and. At the time, I had just finished university, but the, the academic in me hadn't left, and I decided to uh, do as much research as I could possibly do and read as many books as I can on this North Caucasus region, and I thought it was uh, fascinating. And sooner or later, I realized, well, there's enough of these fighters in the UFC, there's going to be enough stories to tell. And as time went on, and with more and more trips to Russia, I started seeing a little bit of a more, a more of a sinister side. Now, there's the fantastic underdog story that you can always tell with many of these fighters, and... In general, they're not to blame for the politics and the, and the horrible things that go on in their in their regions like Dagestan and Chechnya. But there are still stories to be told, and it became a much bigger issue about in, uh, shedding light on stories that people generally don't want to talk about. And that's what I've focused over the past year doing, even though it takes a lot out of me. And I, it's taken away from that storytelling aspect that I, I enjoy so much. A lot of these stories I felt the need to, to share, and I felt that they had to be told, because if I don't tell them, most Russian journalists, even a lot of people seem to congratulate me on, on work I've done, but what I keep trying to tell a lot of people is this is readily available information that is accessible quite easily in Russia. It's just most choose not to write about it. All I'm doing is picking up something that's already there and running with it. It's not like I'm inventing, it's not like I'm coming up with this or digging very deep to find this stuff. It's all there, it's all in the open. People just don't like talking about it in Russia. The truth is, I've been told time and time again, Kareem, what's the point of what you're doing? It's not going to change anything here. Now, that might be true, but my key behind all this has never been uh, activism or a sort of uh, an intention to change the world. It's more access to information and public knowledge. I've, I preach this time and time again. As long as the information is out there and more and more, fans can understand the region a lot more. Every time they see a fighter, I want them to think of, I think it was Mike Goldberg who used the term Dagestani killer last uh, weekend on, on a UFC card. I want them to truly understand what that reference means and how many people in Dagestan would not be very impressed with such a statement. There's a, there's a lot going on. I just hope that for as long as I'm writing about MMA, I can continue to educate people. Well, and that, my friends, is why he's the best in the business. Um, like you said, you you went from not knowing. Uh, it's it's a fascinating journey to me, yours in particular, because because you say you went from not knowing much of anything about Russia to, I mean, frankly, being the at this point realistically the foremost like leading expert in Russian mixed martial arts as, as far as a Western audience's consumption goes. Um, you know, I I know that I have learned basically everything that I have learned about the North Caucasus region, their uh, in their contribution to the sport of MMA, which at this point is also uh, a lot. I learned from you, from reading your articles, from your investigative work, or as you say, not investigative. Apparently, it's it's just out there to be open, uh, and nobody wants to speak about it. Um, that all came from you. So uh, my, my next question before we start kind of delving into these specific topics is why uh, you said that, that the information is easily accessible and why are you able or motivated to telling these stories that others aren't? Like why um, – and I suppose it's possible that in the, that the Russian media – is in fact telling some of these stories and, and maybe we just over here aren't getting them, but you said that that's not really the case. Why are they not interested in, in kind of discussing the topics that, that you have seen so fit and done so well to explain to the rest of the mixed martial arts fan base? Well, I think I can split uh, Russian media into two segments. One that's roughly ignorant or is just plain ignorant and has no interest in covering these topics because they just don't tend to believe them or don't, don't tend to see the problems or being associated with uh, with dictators etc they'll, they'll cover all sorts of different topics with that regard uh, with regards to the oligarchs and and the dictators involved in mma as though it was a badge of honor or as though it was a joke rather than a serious topic for discussion and the other segment are the ones that actually do write about it Problem is, if they do, and a lot of them do, they're held accountable for it. And in Russia, if that's your nation and you're held accountable in that country, 
Imagine the different things you can go to jail for, for being a media member in Russia. And you'll, be, you'll legitimately be targeted, depending on where you are. If you're in Chechnya, there are human rights groups and human rights activists that are regularly targeted. They'll have paint dumped on them. They'll be beaten up on the streets. Uh, that's a little less likely in Moscow. But when you're dealing with uh, how many... I, I'm trying to think right now, off the top of my head, how many media outlets significant media outlets have been shut down in Russia over the past couple of years based on the new laws that have come up in the country over the past while. I mean, Putin is creating an environment where propaganda is king, and that's the only sort of reporting that's acceptable anymore. Investigative journalism is dead at this point in Russia, or if it's not, it's dying of a terminal cancer that I can't imagine what's going to fix it at this point. And the new journalists, the people who are coming up from the new era, uh, you can say a lot of them, I mean, at this point, there's going to be a group of people and journalists that are co heading into journalism school or say students who are heading into journalism school that were born with Putin as president. Now, can you imagine their perspective heading in and studying journalism and what they've seen of the world from, say, the year 2000, etc., or the year 1998? That's, 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 that's nothing. So you're dealing with people who don't generally want to cover the topics or people who know that if they cover these topics, it could, could mean their death, could mean imprisonment, could mean exile, could mean multiple different things. And that's what journalists generally have to deal with. Anyone who follows my Twitter timeline in general could be, uh, uh, I can understand it being uh, tedious or tiresome to a lot of people because in general, I do retweet a lot of different things relating to activism, etc. or things particularly that I find interesting are issues of media censorship, which Russia is uh, king of at this point. They can, they can teach classes about uh, media censorship at this point because they're just, they've mastered it. Man, uh, not to get too off topic here, but it gives that that gives me a terrifying look into what may await us here if things go a particularly bad bad rate in the United States. But I don't want to delve on that because that'll just really bum me out. So let's uh let's transition into the topics of conversation and we've sort of been been touching around it. Um, but uh, specifically, you mentioned uh, the the Chechnyan. Chechnya. Uh, I'm not entirely. What what do you call Chechnya? Is that an independent republic that operates in? I'm not, I'm not really sure how to categorize that, but mainly I'm trying to get us to Ramzan Ramzan uh, Kadyrov, the uh, the head of the Chechen Republic, and uh, by many accounts, Vladimir Putin's one of his right hand men. Uh, can you just for the listeners who maybe haven't read your work or who aren't you know, super versed in this particular topic. Can you kind of give them a brief background on who uh, Ramzan Kadyrov is and why he is a central figure uh, in your work and sort of in what we'll be discussing? Well, to understand Ramzan Kadyrov, you have to go back to understand Chechnya as a whole, first of all. So to answer the first parts of uh, where you were confused there, you can refer to it as uh, Chechnya, which is how Chechens prefer to refer to it rather than the Republic, uh, then, rather than the Chechen Republic, which is how Russia generally refers to it. And the reason for that is Chechnya was known as that. Well, when they were uh, first attacked and invaded during Tsarist, the Tsarist Empire many, many centuries ago, and they underwent many wars overall. And that was at the same point where it was not just Chechens, but there were Circassians, and the Circassians were basically uh, exterminated. And that's a society that's an entire society that very few of them are left and just the culture overall no longer exists. You'll find them uh, sporadically placed around uh, Jordan and other countries like that and Dubai, etc. but you won't find them uh, in many other places. Now, Chechnya survived that, that invasion and they became a sort of Russia's like border over in that side of the world uh, during the time when, 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 when the czars were expanding under Peter the Great, etc. And ever since then, there's been tension between them. And you can understand that the, that the local Chechens were never Russians, but they were forced to become Russians. They were allowed to practice Islam, but a certain kind of Islam, and they were controlled. And Russia practiced uh, clan wars and made sure that uh, the clans were always fighting each other. And uh, the countries were ne the republics were never allowed to prosper 
they were just feeding the, the main Russian empire. And that's a uh, tension and that's a uh, hatred that never, never left basically. And that leads us to the early nineties where the first Chechen war occurred. And that was when independent uh, insurgency took over and actually invaded Dagestan and attempted to secure what they wanted to be the Islamic Caliphate, which is basically like, uh, you can think of it as a blueprint to what, what ISIS has gone and done basically between Syria and Iraq. It was exactly what the Chechens were trying to do at the time. And that brought about the Chechen war, which started under Boris Yeltsin, Russia's first president after the fall of the Soviet Union. And from Bo Boris Yeltsin's, the way he handled the war was an absolute disaster. It was a disaster for both sides. Like the casualties on both sides were horrendous. And by the time the first uh, Chechen war ended, nothing had really changed much. Uh, uh, there were still there were the rebels that within Chechnya and and the different guerrilla groups the factions were still fighting each other they were still fighting Russians and then we had the the terrorist attacks that were happening within Moscow there was the the hostage holdup in, in the in the Moscow theater and uh, multiple really really tragic events and key events that are pivotal in understanding the relationship between Chechnya and uh, Russia as a whole and and the societies. And this leads us afterwards to the Second Chechen uh, War. And I'm really giving very brief background here, but anybody who's really interested in this, it's not very hard to, to research the details. They're fascinating and very, very sad stories. And i am it's not a bold statement, I don't think, to say that the way Russia bombarded Grozny, the capital city of Chechnya, bombed it to the ground, is not much different to what we're witnessing right now in Aleppo. And it's once again the Russian army that's behind these attacks. If you want to understand uh, the evils of this world, one might want to look back at history and see what they did to Grozny to understand why Aleppo is in the state it is right now. And uh, once Grozny fell, the the rebel leader at the time had already switched over. And the rebel leader went by a name called Ahmed Khadirov. And Ahmed Khadirov had switched sides to Putin who was a president by the time the Second Chechen War came about. And uh, funnily enough, he's also president right now during this Aleppo crisis. But Ahmed Khadirov had switched sides and convinced his rebel his rebels to be on Putin's side, so which increased the leverage on that side. Once the Chechen war, once the war ended, he was instated as, uh, as the, the first uh, leader of the Republic. It became the Republic of Chechnya under Russia once again. Now, Ahmed Khadirov, as a father of Ramzan Kadyrov, actually. Now, Ahmed Kadyrov was assassinated a couple of years later, and Kadyrov was put into power in 2006. So Kadyrov was 40 years old when he came into power. There was a leader in between them, but there was, the only reason that was the case was because Kadyrov couldn't take uh, power until until a certain age. So now you have this young man who's leader and all he knew all his life was to fight as a rebel and here we are with him as the leader of chechnya and there is a certain relationship that needs to be maintained at this point and putin is selected kadyrov because he believed from that clan had basically uh, had allegiance to to russia in the sense that they were all on the same side at this point they wanted the same thing they wanted peace and they wanted this to be over so what kadyrov the young Kadyrov, Ramzan Kadyrov, was able to leverage in the end was a sizable budget from the Kremlin every year, bigger than what was given to the Republic of Dagestan and other uh, republics in Ossetia and others in the, re in the region like Ossetia and many others. He was able to get a much larger size budget and he used it to rebuild Grozny mainly Grozny, a lot of Chechnya in general, but mainly Grozny. If you take, looks, uh, if you take a look at uh, a tourist website, say, for, for, for Grozny right now, you'll see spectacular buildings with lights everywhere. It looks like Baku, Azerbaijan, and many other cities that have been well-developed right now, oil-rich cities in that regard. So the Kremlin spent a lot of money and gave Kadyrov a lot of money to build up his country, and he started building his cult of personality at the same time. He became the hero of 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 the 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 Caucasus people because a he was exceptionally wealthy at this point he had the Kremlin listening to him because they were sending him money 
And apart from that, he was helping the people, people who had been so desperate and had seen years of struggle and years of war and horrible things done to them by the Russian regime. And I mean horrendous, horrendous, horrendous atrocities for a war that they generally didn't start as civilians. For undereducated human beings, they saw Ramzan Kadyrov as a savior. So that is the reason he is generally beloved by a certain segment of the people and specifically by the elites of Chechnya. Now, he elevated an entire class of Chechen people from his clan to become heads of state. I mean, like heads of the, 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 his government, all over the place, heads of the, uh, the military. Now, these are very, very, very powerful Chechens. And for MMA fans who tend to watch the Ahmed MMA shows, that Chechen elite is present cage side next to Kadyrov at every single one of those events. You take a look at those photos from those events and you'll see faces that you'll probably recognize from New York Times articles for other things entirely. Fighters, for instance, one of them was just present at an Ahmed event. Two days later, he was there and pictures were taken of him as he uh, watched the send-off of the Chechen faction of the Spetsnaz Special Forces take off for Syria. So, for those who don't think that sports and politics are generally relevant, I introduce you to Ramzan Kadyrov. I think, Jed, that that's as, as simple an introduction to the characters as I can get into without describing the, the fact that this, that this particular dictator ended up maintaining power and he's still in control now, but the human rights atrocities that have, that have, have allegedly occurred under his rule, because we sadly can't prove much with a regime like Chechnya, but uh, atrocities that have occurred under Kadyrov are too are too great to to list off right now. I suggest people look into it and uh, determine for themselves what kind of uh, leaders you want to see involved in mixed martial arts. And that really kind of uh, gets to the heart of why I wanted to have you on here is is that he is in fact a leader involved in mixed martial arts, and he is has quickly kind of grown to. You know, not not on the level, I guess, in the grand scheme of the sport as like, uh, you know, Ari Emanuel or Dana White, but he has cultivated a set of power and that that matters and is substantive going forward, uh, specifically through his interactions with a lot of high level fighters. And then your work is covered uh, this pretty well. I would encourage any and everybody to uh, go to go and uh, check that out, uh, most mostly at Bloody Elbow, but look around, Google Google Kareem's name, and, and you'll find where you're trying to get to. But uh, I, I do want to talk about his sort of influence in, you know, in the MMA sphere, uh, specifically with both, you know, caucus region fighters. Uh, I know that, um, and we're going to get into this more specifically, but uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov is has at least some some substantive relationship with him uh, i hope you can speak more to the depth of that but uh i mean it's it's been a point of point of note that uh, you know at the time that he was a heavyweight champion i believe fabrice Verdum uh flew flew over to chechnya and and spent time with him frankie edgar uh, a set of a set group of fighters who are big important names in the sport have a lot of interactions with a a man who by many accounts is a a war criminal um and or a warlord depending on who you want to speak to or those type of things and so uh i would i'd kind of like your i guess your take on on his involvement with fighters uh both in the caucus regions and not and and kind of take that separately because i do feel that there's likely a political social difference between caucus region fighters who grew up in the caucus region who live in Chechnya or Dagestan and, you know, have, he is in, in many ways their superior, I suppose. It's not exactly the word I'm looking for, but you get the point. He, he has a direct tangible connection on their lives that, that is not through their own choice and their interaction with him may be different um, than, you know, Fabrice Overdoom who has no, no requisite to kind of interact with Hamzan Kadyrov, and it is entirely a a personal choice to do so. So, like, if you 
kind of just tell me, like, what is your opinion on Fabrizio Verdum and, and Frankie Edgar and these type of folks that are that are opting to uh, to interact with him in a, in a fashion? And is it any t- it is, is it different than a uh, Habib Nurmagomedov or uh, I think Rashid Magomedov as uh, as well? Has like got a car from him. I could be wrong on that. I, I'll have you correct me if I'm right. Is there a substantive difference between uh, these two interactions with this man? Um, and if so, kind of explain that. Oh, there's a big difference. While Kadyrov's intentions might be similar from both, it's some sort of political or, or gain or propaganda from uh, aligning himself and associating with the masculine fighters. And I can get into those details in a second, but to answer your question, there is, a, there is a significant difference, and I, I'm willing to give the the local fighters like <clears throat> Khabib, even though Khabib is from Dagestan and not Chechnya, you have to understand the influence that Khedirov's scope of influence extends if, past Chechnya into neighboring republics like Dagestan. And if Ingl- I could cut into you right now, because that was actually a question I was going to get into, but kind of got lost, um, and I guess now might be a good time to sort of jump into it, but uh, Chechnya and Dagestan are obviously separate republics that are located you know in they're spatially close to each other but yeah if you could kind of explain how Kadarov's sort of sphere of influence gr- reaches across you know republic borders into Chechnya or Dagestan or North Ossetia or any of that that would be great well and a small example for instance I wrote an article recently for Open Democracy talking about when the state Duma elections which happened in September and that's their sort of their assembly how, when that when that uh, occurred back in September, Kadyrov had been uh, campaigning significantly to have uh, Busevar Saiti, the, the the very famous uh, freestyle Olympian and uh, legend, greatest wrestler of all time. Yeah, exactly, uh, greatest uh, freestyle wrestler of all time. Had had him, and, and we should I should note right now that Saiti not only is the greatest freestyle wrestler in, in history by many accounts. Is also an advisor to Kadyrov, so again another association between between two factions. But in general, with Satif and Kadyrov, it goes a lot deeper than that. They were actually their their partnership with the Kadyrov started when Ahmed Kadyrov, Ramzan Kadyrov's father, took over. But anyway, back to the point uh, that, that I'm trying to make here, which is he campaigned to have Satif become uh, sort of the the, the head. To get to get the open spot in Khazavayot, which is a town on the border of Chechnya and Dagestan, but it's in Dagestan. But the influence in that in that specific city, that specific city, actually a lot of insurgents come out of, and it's been well known as to be a base for fundamentalism within the the North Caucasus. He wanted Saitiv to be. The influence there, because then you would have he would have one of his own people in Kasabayut, in the republic, in, in the the government, and under his scope of influence, basically. And the people there are significant because the, because there's about fifty something percent of the population there is actually Chechen, and that once upon a time, prior to Stalin's uh, decision to to. Uh, like absolutely change up the borders in the North Caucasus and throw different uh, people out of the country just in general. But uh, before he did that, Khazavayot actually belonged to, to Chechnya. So this is part of Kadyrov's gradual plan to set, to have take control of the entire North Caucasus. Basically, there are there have been Dagestani mayors who have claimed that he has threatened them with their, with, their, with their lives, basically. So it's not it's not a surprise at all to think that all the neighboring republics hold their breath whenever Ramzan Kadyrov steps into a room or is associated with them or they get a phone call from him at all. He wants to control the entire region because again, more leverage he has, the more he can leverage with the Kremlin. And if anyone's following Kremlin politics this year, which I can't imagine many MMA fans really will, except a couple that I'm able to convert. But for the ones that that don't. Uh, follow Kremlin politics, there's been a lot of renegotiating between that budget that I spoke about earlier that helped build up Grozny to a sort of a superficially impressive city. That budget was uh, diminished by, by, the, by the Kremlin this year and 
The reasons for that is because many believe that Putin is trying to put Kadyrov on a tighter leash after all the many incidents that have occurred over the past few years. Uh, they feel like he's become too uh, big for his boots, for lack of a different uh, term I can come up with uh, right now. But basically, it's, uh, it's, the intention was to put Kadyrov on a leash again, and, or the, uh, so say the analysts. And the more he is able to leverage power over other republics, the more chance he'll have of convincing the Kremlin that they still need him as much as they once did 10 years ago or 15 or, or yeah, it's about 10 years ago when, when this all started, basically. So it's, it's very, very significant, the, 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 the influence he has on these different uh, regions. We can't, we can't uh, underestimate that. And associating with someone like Khabib Nurmagomedov not only convinces a certain segment of Dagestanis that Kadyrov is uh, is is one of them or loves their fighters etc etc or cares for them or has any sort of compassion apart from achieving that sort of small uh, uh, belief from from a small segment of the people he continues the same perspective that I am the, the, the leader of the people who will associate with these athletes and these MMA fighters I mean he's sort of a smaller version of Putin in that regard, specifically in that, in that perspective, because I mean, Putin has been associating with Jean-Claude Van Damme, uh, Fedor Emelianenko, and uh, the list goes on and on and on. And it's the exact same uh, macho propaganda being spewed by uh, sort of a, the mirror image of him and the a mirror image of Putin in the, in the Caucasus. So that similarity is very important. But to come back to what you were saying a little earlier about the, the difference the difference between Kadyrov's association with Khabib, say, and local fighters and and Kadyrov's association with Verdun is that Khabib knows it's 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 tough to imagine a local fighter getting a call or an invitation from Kadyrov and turning it down. Now unless you're a Slavic Russian or someone who's not even associated or far away in, in the country in general, but even then you might be trembling a little bit when you get that invitation. So I don't see why he wouldn't, at the very least, attend uh, and, uh, or, or be accepted openly by, by Kadir, because not only does that ally you with a, uh, with a very powerful person in the region for, for, for Khabib, it also secures you and your family. You, you maintain your position in the Russian elite, because in sports, in Russia, sportsmen like, like, and athletes like Khabib, are elevated to the Russian elite through, through negotiating with politicians, through eventually entering politics. So this is a, a, definitely a first step for Khabib because I, I mean, you'll probably hear this from me first here, but I can imagine Khabib, once he retires, entering politics and being very significant in Dagestani politics and in the state Duma, just because of how beloved he is right now and the general belief that he is a modest, pious uh, human being and a fantastic representative for Muslim Russians. So. Kadyrov allying himself with, with Khabib is, makes sense. And Khabib allying himself with Kadyrov, if you, if you can allow yourself to think from a non-Western perspective, makes sense as well. Not only does it keep him alive, keeps him secure, but it offers him an ally for the future. But Fabrizio Verdum, on the other hand, is a baffling case. And many like him. I mean, it wasn't just Verdum, and it didn't start with Verdum. It actually started uh, not just with Verdum, but with Chris Weidman, and Frank Mir. So the very first Ahmed had, had three former UFC champions sitting there. One of them was the current heavyweight champion at the time, and all of them attended the event. And you had to see Kadyrov just telling them to dance in his palace. And they'd get on on the stage and they'd dance for him. And like the, they're dancing what was called a lesginka, which is a ch traditional Caucasus dance. And the way it looked was he was just clapping them on, telling them to dance, dance. And all I could think in my head was the, that image of the dance monkey dance, because I couldn't believe it. It's just like you flash some money and you can get anybody to do anything for you. And that's all it was. It was a cash grab for these, uh, for these fighters. And I hope one day they have to answer to this horrendous PR mistake that they've all had to do. And I can tell you right now, it's either willful ignorance or just general ignorance that occurred right there, because... Uh, Chris Weidman and Frank, Frankie Edgar, they don't, and maybe Frank Muir too, they don't really strike me as uh, politically aware, generally. I mean, Chris Weidman said he was a Trump guy, and I'm sorry, people, but that doesn't strike me as politically aware in general. But, uh, uh, yeah, 
I can't imagine they either cared what Kadyrov was, really knew what it was, or simply thought it was badass. And Fabrizio Verdum, on the other hand, he was told numerous times by not only his managers and multiple different people around him, well, maybe not his manager, his manager is Ali Abdelaziz, who was the person who set this entire uh, deal up, same with Frankie Edgar. But uh, in general, I know that people have reached out to Fabrizio Verdum, and he was even questioned about it with Ariel Hawani online, and all he said was he thinks it's great that he's treated like a prince, and he's treated fantastically by a generous, wonderful, amazing man like Gramzan Fabrizio. I hope people could sense the sarcasm and oozing from me over there. <laughs> but thank you thank for you clarifying that. Um, I, I'm sorry, it feels like I'm jumping all over the place and from point to point and slight tangents here. It's just you have to understand how much there is to cover and how each question can literally... Have, uh, each question literally deserves its own two-hour answer if you want me to be true to the material itself. So to no, try no. to connect everything just to make sure that whoever is listening to this actually makes sense of it all is a little difficult. No, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, I, I would ask on that same kind of, uh, that same tip, how much does, I mean, you spoke that uh, Kadarov is, he is looking tough by association in many ways. He's got, he's got these kind of big, important masculine figures and he's associating with them. And that's, that's sort of the, the payoff for him. How much, uh, and in my head, when I think of that, like, uh, so for a local fighter, for a local Chechen fighter that rises up through the ranks, or, you know, by proxy, could be Habib Nurmagomedov is is regionally close. I can understand uh, sort of the import of that, but how how important is a Frankie Edgar or Frank Mir or Fabrizio Verdum to to Katarov in general? Does what's the What's the sort of local awareness of who these people are, what they represent, as opposed to, uh, you know, a local fighter who maybe they're following more closely? Because I, I just, frankly, I have no idea what the general MMA consumption is like in the region. And, you know, I, uh, a few uh, a few months ago, I think before UFC 202, somebody did like a uh, uh, man in the street segment in Ireland asking people like who what the Conor McGregor fight was going to be. And everybody in Ireland kind of knew who Conor McGregor was, but that same recognition didn't extend to other fighters. So I'm sort of just kind of asking how much does Katarov gain by having Fabrizio Verdum come? Or is it just one of those situations where, well, I can, and I will gain some political capital here. Uh, and it doesn't cost me anything because the amount of money I have to spend to achieve this end doesn't is pretty negligible considering what I have in my means. It's, I think there's a part of him that's a little child that's just happy to just gleefully spend all this money. I mean, you know, there's there's a picture of Better Hari floating around, and I just did a recent article on Better Hari's relationship with Kadyrov, and there's an article floating around about, uh, sorry, sorry, a picture floating around with, with Better Hari, sitting in a gold bathtub with a gold-plated AK-47, just smiling away, talking about his uh, his friendship with Kadyrov, like in, in the caption below that. And to think this man has a gold bathtub and gold-plated thing, I mean, it, it just reminds me of, of, of the ridiculous, ostentatious-style Arab, uh, oil-rich Arab spending that I grew up seeing in the Gulf. Uh, in, the, in the Middle East around me as well. So I get that impression from a lot of it. It's just he has it, he has the money, and he wants to spend it. But at the very at the very same time, it's calculated. And something like, first, for instance, say the Chechen population doesn't really watch mixed martial arts or didn't start watching mixed martial arts until Kadyrov put it on their local television and started blasting his propaganda about the, about their fighters all over all over uh, his networks, which he can entirely controls because they're all government controlled in Chechnya. As soon as he says, uh, as soon as he's paid the 100k each to bring Fabrizio, Chris Weidman and Frank Mir, he'll announce on all those uh, different uh, media outlets that he, that he either owns or controls by fear and intimidation that we are bringing in UFC champions. UFC is the number one organization in the world. These are American champions. They are coming here to show respect to Ramzan Kadyrov. 
And no matter whether you've watched them before, you haven't watched them before, the statement is out there, the statement's the same. American UFC champions from the best organization in the world are coming to show respect for Kadyrov and to watch his MMA event here. Now, for the uneducated, and Kadyrov makes sure they stay uneducated, Chechen population, that's an easy sell. That's an easy sell. He's a, he's a strong leader. He's a big leader. He's a great leader. Look at him. This is, we have, we now have, there was once a day, a time when no one knew Chechnya. Now the Americans know Chechnya and they come and sit with our leader. That's a, that's a certain level of pride for people who not only no longer are being bombed every day, but are living a good life generally. Now, I seem to be painting a, a positive impression here, and I really want people just to understand that this is just the, the this is the image, this is the superficial image that they're trying to present. Most of Chechnya is starving, most of the Chechen people are not happy, and most of them are well aware. And the ones who still preach Kadyrov's uh, brilliance are either being intimidated or are simply just too afraid to even think about or, or contemplate speaking that they've just uh, burned the memory of, 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 of the, the issues that they have with them out of their heads entirely. That's how terrifying it can be to be in, in Chechnya. So don't take the sparkling lights of, of Grozny to mean anything. At the end of the day, he's been a, a magnanimous authoritarian leader because that's how they like to present themselves. They, they cause chaos and destruction, and then when they help the lives of a few, they're seen as magnanimous. And that's exactly the impression he wants to give and exactly the impression he wants to maintain. But adding, I mean, again, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, he's bringing in athletes like that not only makes him look like a hell of a ruler, even the outlets abroad that uh, mention Kadyrov, just getting a mention means that he now is a little bit more known. When John Oliver has kids making fun of him, still, so Kadyrov would not look at that and be insulted. Kadyrov would look at that and be like, well, there you go. Not only are these American outlets recognizing that I exist and that I'm here, but they're making such a joke out of this that most people won't even take how dangerous I am very seriously. He wins on so many different fronts by simply doing like these very small gestures that it's incredible. It's no, no such thing as bad press, they say, and I suppose that holds true here in general. For him. It certainly does. I had someone recently telling me Kadyrov's not relevant in the slightest. I sent him an article trying to explain the dictator's the dictator concept of winning 97% in an election, and which which he just recently did in his in his most. Just brought, I was just about to bring that up. <laughs> and I couldn't, I couldn't. And the person not only told me that this was not relevant, and that I should be instead writing about Anthony Pettis missing weight to the 206 weigh and not as though a thousand other journalists were doing the exact same thing anyway. But not only did he not think that that was relevant, he he was convinced. I mean, I. I Jed, you saw that discussion, right? You said you were going to bring it up. You tell me right now, what, where, do, where do, you, do you think I was in any way out of line to think that there is a relevance to the points that I'm trying to make and that me sending him an article, a New York Times article with Kadyrov, explaining that Kadyrov winning 97% of this election is very similar to how Uzbekistan used to do, is very similar to how Egypt, my own country's... Uh, uh, CC just won 97% recently as well, but that's just the dictator status simple. That's how they win with 97% and all he responds with you sent me an article with someone in, a, in, in pictured in armor Because Kadyrov was wearing medieval armor to his celebration. I mean at, at a certain point I just need to not have discussions with certain people like that because they're just out to troll and out to be ridiculous But this one in specific it just I couldn't I couldn't grasp it because not. I, it went on afterwards to discuss. That he claimed that I had Pentagon sources, and the only reason I was writing this is because my my American overlords wanted me to spread propaganda. <laughs> I, I mean, what? <laughs> um, I have. Uh, I will not even sort of pretend to be nearly as versed in this topic as you are. But um, as part of my writing for MMAfighting.com, I've. Uh, I've pimped out a lot of your articles because I like your work and I think it's good and should be read on a wide scale. And I have, I have uh, met many. I won't say many. I've definitely come across some of the same sort of individuals who will then lambast me for parroting uh, Western propaganda and, <laughs> and things. And it's it's just kind of amazing to me that anybody could be like, yeah, that's just horrible propaganda. When somebody wins ninety eight percent of an election, like that's just not 
That seems really self-evidently a ridiculous thing to me, but this is the space in which we inhabit, my friend. This is this is MMA. Um, I would like to uh, just ask you one one quick question on this same topic again. Uh, sort of some we discussed the the pro the benefits to fighters for sort of aligning themselves behind Katarov, um, be they foreign or you know local to the area. Um, are there, I mean, are there any fighters that have op opted not to sort of, that have sort of opted to distance themselves from him? Um, is that just a thing that, I, I mean, local fighters, not like, you know, somebody in America who opts not to take a hundred grand to fly over, but is there a, a, a group or a, an individual Chechen or Dagestani fighter who, you know, is sought by Katarov and is has chosen to know I don't really want to be involved there. Is that a thing that happens or is that a complete non-starter? Honest, and I'm, and I'm thinking as, as you started that question, I started thinking and spanning my brain for a while. And I honestly cannot think of a single fighter who's been offered to go see, to go meet with Kadyrov and is turned it down or a, a sought after fighter who was open from the region who was openly uh, come out against Kadyrov. That's a death sentence. I, yeah. I, I, people really need to understand just how risky that sort of thing is. It's not something you want to do at all. You don't want to come out against Kadyrov or against any of his uh, people. It's not a good thing, which is what makes Nikita Krylov uh, targeting Abdukarim Edelov one of Kadyrov's favorite fighters, basically, and the person who trained Kadyrov's children for their MMA fights recently in that big scandal that occurred. The fact that uh, that Nikita Krylov was actually willing to come out and challenge Abdukarim Edelov, I hope people understand just how courageous, like truly, truly courageous that move is. Either courageous or just exceptionally stupid. Exceptionally stupid. I, I tend to favor courageous because I'm a big I'm a big minor fan. I and as I think many people are, Nikita Krylov is just a delight. And uh, w did you do the long form form story on him? Yes, I did. I thought I, I assumed that it had to have been you, but in, I didn't want to inappropriately credit you with, if somebody else had done the work. Uh, that I strongly encourage any of the listeners to go check that out if you haven't already. Um, it kind of delves into why uh, Nikita Krylov changed his name from Al Capone to the minor, his sort of, his familial history and, and everything that went, that goes into his backstory. It's it's a really great piece of writing and uh, you should absolutely check that out. Um, I kind of, I want to stay in the same, same realm, but maybe make a slight pivot here. Um, you, uh, you tweeted yesterday and brought to my attention um uh, about um, our favorite fighter in the world, Khabib Nurmagomedov, the best lightweight on the planet of Earth, uh, <laughs> was doing a fan Q and A and a seminar in Almaty, Kazakhstan. Um, and for those who aren't aware, just in case it needs to be said, Kazakhstan is not a; it's an independent nation. It's not a republic under Russian purview. Um, but just just to throw that out there in case anybody needs to know. Um, so, you no, know, two different people tweeted at me asking me, well, why are you posting more things of him in Russia? I'm like, because he's not in Russia, maybe. Oh, did they really? <laughs> oh, yeah, That's... I got multiple ones like that. Oh, that doesn't surprise me. And I was, I felt a little bad having to say it, but I thought maybe it needed to be clarified. Um, so Kazakhstan is its own independent nation state. It's, um, <laughs> But by by all accounts, and certainly by your account, and what appear to be photos here, and as well as on uh, Habib's uh, personal social media accounts, it was it was a big to do. Habib puts on this this fan Q and A and a seminar, and it was packed out, overflowing. People standing in the streets in freezing temperatures. I checked the weather yesterday; is like thirty two in Atali. Um, so. Uh, Habib is Habib's reach extends beyond just the Caucasus region, or just beyond you know Dagestan, or just beyond sort of Chechen uh, connection. There, it, it extends out into the general landscape of that area of the world. Um, and I know we've discussed. Uh, well, I, before I get into this question, can you kind of explain how popular Habib is to 
to the fan who isn't aware of the sort of fan base that exists outside of the United States? Certainly. Well, I mean, to be honest, it's, it's, it's a good question. It's an important question. It's something I hope to address in, in the long future at some point, because I, I, I believe it, it deserves that attention, because I don't think we've ever seen a star quite like Khabib Nurmagomedov, and I think that's fair to say. And the reason for that is he... he let's, let me put it this way. There is no other fighter in Russia, an active MMA fighter in Russia, from Russia, who is as sought after for seminars, for Q&As, for business opportunities, for sponsorship opportunities, like Khabib Nurmagomedov, that's not named Fedor Emelianenko. Now, why is this significant? I mean, we can always say, well, there's always got to be the next big star after the first star. We're seeing it right now with Conor McGregor. It takes over from the one before and the one before, and it's almost, it's, it's a cycle and it continues, and that's fine. The difference is, when we're talking about a, a, a mainly Christian Orthodox Slavic country like Russia, and its biggest star is Muslim. And that's significant because if, if, if for those who have been following from the beginning of this, of this uh, podcast, when we just started talking, I addressed a lot of uh, the tension and the conflict between uh, Russia and the North Caucasus. And I know I, I, I zoomed in on Chechnya, but it applies the same to the entire region mainly. And uh, that conflict spreads to uh, social concepts in the end. Like you'll end up with a lot of racism towards the North Caucasus and a lot of... Uh, I, I, I don't want to compare it to, to, to uh, racial problems in the United States because I think each one is, is very different. But I think the remnants and both are, are, are quite similar in, in Russia. And, but I'd say Russia is still a little more extreme uh, in, its, in its portrayal of it. But you'll still, I, I've had Chechens inform me that they were called, they, they, they'll be called by, by Slavic Russians the, the, the N-word, for instance. So that's that, for people who want to understand just sort of the, the, the perspective on, on different people. So for Khabib to be able to touch all these different people, all these different communities and all these different religions in Russia and to extend beyond that into Central Asia, and we're talking Uzbekistan, we're talking uh, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, that's a massive, massive... We're talking the majority of the former Soviet Union is are fans of Khabib Nurmagomedov. If the UFC is able to even slightly tap into that fandom somehow, then they found an incredible star, it's fair to say. For the Russians, he represents not only a lot of, especially the Muslim Russians, not only does he represent one of them, which they rarely get to display on an international scene with such dominance in the United States, but he's a role model, not only for his own people, but one that they'd like to project onto the international community and say, look at us, look at our, our superstar, is pious, is modest, is respectable, is, uh, is, uh, and is dominant. And they'll compare that to, say, the West, and they'll say the corrupting West has nothing but uh, Conor McGregor, who looks and acts like <laughs> him. And honestly, that will be their comparison. So for them, that's, that's something to be proud of, to have a representative like Khabib. And in I mean, many ways... And in many ways, he honestly does live up to that uh, to that name. Forget the, the the relationship to Kadyrov, and I hope people take me seriously when I when I mean you have to consider both sides of the equation with why Khabib would be associated with Kadyrov, and don't immediately uh, fault him for these. There are other reasons you maybe you have to fault him, like in a relationship with Ali Abdulaziz, for instance. But I wouldn't necessarily count Kadyrov as anything more than him securing his life. But, uh, and it's sad that, the, that I have to say that, and it's sad that, a fight, that he, as an athlete in his position, is, is, is put in a position like that. And he'll be forever in a position like that unless he defects <laughs> out, of, out of Russia, so, which, which I guarantee you he wouldn't want to do. But his stardom is, is incredible. It's incredible. It's like nothing I've ever seen in Russia, and I've asked many people. And even those who don't like him in Russia will still watch him and still know how important he is for <laughs> Russian sports in general. Um, well, you, you are right. There is a stark contrast between Conor McGregor and Habib. Um, Doesn't that add a beautiful layer to that fight, though? Like, uh, for me, it, it's not, uh, you, you now understand my perspective and how I like to view sports in general. For me, that's the story that matters. To me. 
that 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 outside layer, all I that think... all the all that background for Habib and, and how it contrasts to McGregor and how that that Western versus old old Russia Soviet mentality, how those come head to head. I, th- I think that that might actually be more entertaining to me than, than, than the fight if it doesn't happen to be one of the best fights ever. <laughs> I, uh, it's, um, when that first, after UFC 205 and it first started really getting bandied about, I, uh, I remarked, I don't remember where, maybe it was on this podcast, that um, I think Khabib Nurmagomedov and Conor McGregor are built to be the perfect foil to one another in sort of like the the ultimate kind of storyline that that sport can generate and they are so diametrically opposed in just about every facet of each other and that they are they are built to be each other's greatest rival and if we don't end up getting kind of a long-term rivalry out of it right now Habib's engaged in a a fun and interesting rivalry with Tony Ferguson but I do think that sort of the best our sport could ever offer would be uh, a long-term rivalry between Habib and Conor McGregor just because they are so different on every, just about every possible facet, um, athletically and politically and everything that goes into that. It would just be a brilliant story. Um, I do, I would like to ask one more question on Habib before we get into our final topic of conversation. Um, and this is this is more of you know counterfactual. It's it's not really going to exist, but just kind of to give context to everything we've been discussing, um, we've established that Habib is very likely to g- move into politics at the completion of his athletic career. It's something that a lot of Russian uh, athletes end up doing. You mentioned Bubasar Saitev, um, and there's a whole host of others that you can kind of look into and see that that's a. Uh, that's a, a career path, a trajectory. Um, but if we if we take that away, if we get outside of of that being his next inevitable career step, um, what just just as a hypothetical, what would be kind of the breakdown? How popular is Habib at this current juncture? That uh, if he were to come out and vocally oppose uh, Kadarov, how do you have any idea how the dynamics of that would look? Uh, it's not even something that I ever considered just because of how much I cannot imagine it occurring. Well, first of all, you'd have to get his family out of Dagestan. He'd have, there'd have to be something specific that occurred that the only reason he'd, have, he'd speak out against it would be because Kadyrov was in the wrong in the first place. And even then, they wouldn't speak out like that. But... It, it would certainly cause quite the divide. Like if, if, if Fedor's comments towards Kadyrov caused the stir they did, I can't even imagine someone who's actually associated to him and someone who actually lives close by. And I mean, hours. Mahashkala is hours away from, from Grozny at the end of the day. They're not far away from each other. You can get there in the same day if you really try it, but... Uh, I can't, I can't imagine it. Like you, you have me stumped here, just because it would definitely, it would definitely be a disaster. It would be a disaster. Yeah, I mean, I, and I'll be, I'll be honest. I didn't pre-plan this question. Just sort of as we were talking, it kind of jumped into my head, just sort of as a context question. Like, well, this is how popular he is. If he and Katerov came to loggerheads, X would happen. Um, I, I lied. I do actually have one further question about Habib. Um, I think you wrote about this before. I'm, I'm not 100%. It's hard to keep up with everything you've written because I read it all, but I don't retain super well um, specifics. But um, I've written a lot on Habib in general and uh, sort of kind of one of the storylines coming about uh, surrounding him this past year had been his quest to get a title shot, the kerfluffle with Conor McGregor kind of jumping the line and everything that sort of revolved around that. And at one point, Habib essentially threatened to walk away from the UFC. He said, you know, after the Michael Johnson fight, if I don't fight for a title, um, I'm going to walk away. I have leverage too. Um, you know, I know the UFC has leverage, but I I basically have leverage over the UFC's expansion efforts into Russia, um, whether they can do that. And uh, that's also, it's also that 
kind of same sentiment has been a calling uh a a a rallying cry for him to sort of get a UFC title shot so you telling Dana White telling the fans telling Conor McGregor look you guys you have fans I have more fans I have the entire Russian people behind me um you know I have millions and millions of people that care about watching me do this thing uh, and as we've established, that's that's pretty true. He has millions of people, not just Russians, but Kazakhs and that entire sort of ethno group there in that sphere of the world uh, supports him. So kind of what what are the you if you have Habib, what is Habib's leverage to both prevent the UFC from kind of making an expansion into Russia? And what is his ability to create to bridge that border, bridge that gap and make, you know, putting on Russian MMA shows, putting on shows in St. Petersburg or something like what, how can he help them in that? How can he hurt them in that sphere? It is twofold. The answer is twofold and it, it, they're, they're both the exact same thing, just reversed. So it's again twofold. There are two people responsible for Khabib being so confident in, in, in his statement that he gave uh, Luke Thomas a while back. And the reason for that is A, Ramzan Kadyrov, and B, Rizvan, or actually, sorry, Ziavuddin Magomedov. Now, Ziavuddin Magomedov, I'd rather start with him because I find this story fascinating. He's an oligarch, a Dagestani oligarch, who's a big fan of Khabib's and He's, he is the, the main stakeholder for uh, Fight Nights, Eurasia Fight Nights, the EFN uh, broadcast, the Russian uh, promotion on UFC Fight Pass. And I think he's fascinating because he attempted to purchase the UFC, wasn't able to do so a few years back, decided, okay, I'll invest in a Russian promotion. And the only reason he had even decided to invest in sports was because he was booted out of the Russian elite by Putin when he took power again. Uh, Ziavuddin made his way up into the Russian elite in the first place and made his first billion when uh, then President Dmitry Medvedev, who's now Russia's prime minister, when he was president, he uh, offered uh, Ziavuddin's company many of the state contracts that helped make the man very, very rich. But when Putin came in, he didn't see him as uh, loyal. So he removed all the oligarchs that... Uh, Medvedev had instated himself that he only has a class loyal to him, something that Putin repeatedly does from time to time. He's done a lot of that this year as well. And uh, yeah, so as soon as that happens, Yevudin decided that sports diplomacy was the way he was going to go about things. And I've written about this multiple times, but uh, purchasing the UFC was one of the ways he wanted to do it. He wanted to have a Russian stake in the UFC, but Matt wasn't able to do it at the time because the Fertitas simply weren't interested with the offer, and uh, that wasn't the point when they were looking to sell just yet. And uh, after that, they purchased uh, Eurasia Fight Night a couple of years ago, had invested a lot of money into them, and then his uh, his big move was securing a relationship with with Khabib by buying him a, a, a Mercedes, I believe. I can't remember the exact kind, but there's an article out there called Perpetual Power Cycle, where I explain the significance of the gift-giving tradition in, in between oligarchs and uh, Russian athletes. And for those who are interested in understanding the significance behind uh, him having that car. But Ziavuddin, long story short, Ziavuddin managed to get, uh, managed to pay Fedor's exorbitant something around 2 million fight purse to fight for fight nights against Fabio Maldonado. And he made sure the event was on the same weekend as the St. Petersburg Economic Forum. And uh, the Economic Forum was a time where he knew Saint Putin would be in St. Petersburg to discuss a lot of different uh, economic uh, things that uh, alliances that he wanted to do with uh, with China and Central Asia, etc. So he made his move then. He invited he invited Putin to the fight because he knows Putin's a fan of Fedor's, but Putin said he was too busy. Instead, he took a meeting with Putin the following morning after the fight, where they agreed to some to uh, he agreed to be the main person behind. Uh, bringing in Elon Musk's Hyperloop 1 tube transportation system into Russia. And he had Putin sign that deal the following day after the Fedor fight. And I promise you, this is no coincidence. This is sports diplomacy at work. And as he aligned himself with Fedor for a specific reason, he aligned himself with Khabib for an entirely different reason. Ziavuddin is keen to take over the 
the fighter market in general in Russia. That's why Khabib recently started the Eagles MMA fight team. It's something very similar to what the, 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 the Prince of Bahrain did with by starting the Brave Association uh, in, uh, in Bahrain and having fighters just under that umbrella that he pays and sponsors, etc., to train full time and to build that new breed of fighters. Well, Ziyabuddin is trying to do a similar thing in, in Russia. And guess who became the president of Eagles MMA? It was Khabib Nurmagomedov. So tying himself in with Khabib, that sort of allegiance, them both being Dagestani, them both growing up from, from poverty, etc. There's a loyalty and a base there between the two of them. And I think Ziyabuddin is very significant because that's someone with a lot of ties to Moscow and the Kremlin right now. And UFC is going to need as many allies as possible entering a market like Russia during a recession, during such uncertain times in general between the two cultures, the two communities, the two ideologies. There's a lot to it, so much so that this is a long form in itself answering the question about the UFC's chances and the UFC's obstacles in Russia. But a simple one is Ziyabuddin Magomedov. He can either be a big ally or either be an enemy. And Funnily enough, a lot of the people that the UFC had once allied themselves with in hopes of entering Russia are now in jail. Like the one, the, the promoter who owns uh, Legends, he's now in jail. <laughs> so they need new friends. Ziyavuddin Magomedov could be a friend, but if they piss Khabib off, Ziyavuddin Magomedov is not going to be a friend. So they're going to they're going to need some help in Russia. They're going to need help associating themselves with the biggest media outlets. There. They're going to need help finding the best venues at the best prices and associating with the Kremlin in the first place. Because one false move and there's no event in, in, and there's no UFC event in Russia. So there's a lot of factors at play with something like that. And here's another one. Now imagine what Kadyrov can do. Just the intimidation factor alone and how he can scare off all sorts of people from ever wanting to work with the UFC or investing in the UFC or helping fund, fund or sponsor the UFC event uh, in Russia. So uh, both are very, very significant. Well, l let me ask you on that uh, particular just uh, – well, one, first, I just – I would like to throw in. Uh, I went and looked it up. Uh, Habib was given a Mercedes AMG GT, retails for around uh, 110 grand US. So that's the type of friends that they are. Um, and he's the other thing. Yeah, it's, I mean, when you're a billionaire, what's a hundred grand? A hundred um, that was a that was a long term investment he just made. It was pennies out of his pocket, but a long term investment that he put into Habib. So, who's really winning in that situation? Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, but but to uh to your point that you just made about uh Kadarov's ability to kind of play spoiler to UFC expansion efforts if he so chose, um, you know, what's his sphere of influence? Uh, obviously, Kadarov would be able to basically kibosh a UFC expansion effort anywhere into his general geographic location with relative simplicity. What's his sphere of influence in Moscow or, you know, extending even up to St. Petersburg? If they wanted to put a card there, how how difficult can he make it for them with his sort of political leverage? Well, the Kadyrov's team in general, and you have to understand the people who run Ahmad MMA are people from his military and people from his elite. It's not like these are people who are specifically made to run martial arts or something or he picked out of nowhere for martial arts. These are people with powerful reputations and are known to be very... I mean, the person who heads Ahmed MMA, he goes by the nickname Patriot. And it's a long story how he got that nickname and why he has that nickname. But to, to understand him, he's a terrifying human being. And anyone knows if you're getting a phone call from Patriot, your life's on the line right there with that phone call. So... Simple phone calls across to different people, across to different promoters, across to different media outlets. You're going to be covering the UFC. Are you going to be doing this? Are you going to be working with them? And that makes life a lot more difficult. It does make life difficult. Even, even say the threats are hollow, which I guarantee you they don't necessarily have to be. Say that, I mean, the only thing that can stop Kadyrov if he wants to screw around, the only thing that can stop him is Putin. And generally, uh, Kremlin intervention, which is basically Putin intervention. It's the arm from the same thing. But that's the only thing that can stop them. So the UFC, basically, if they want to come into Russia, you don't just necessarily need Khabib's approval, but you need Kremlin approval to be in Russia. It's that simple. Well, don't forget the UFC has been vocal supporters of President-elect Trump, who 
by most accounts, seems to have a pretty good uh, working relationship with Vladimir Putin. So maybe that plays out well for them. And it hurts me to say those words. I um, promise you that I will have a story out on that sometime soon. Oh, that's good. I didn't even realize that I was I was doing that for you. Um, okay, we've gone long, but there is still one last topic of conversation that I desperately wanted to get into. Um, and it... I mean, in general, it will it will require your particular set of skills here, but but it is kind of more just a moral quandary. I've I wrestled with for a bit and then decided I wanted to not think about so you and I could just have a a candid discussion on air and see kind of where that gets us. And I'm speaking, of course, about Alexander Emelianenko. Um, for those who don't know, Alexander Emelianenko is the brother of heavyweight. Goat and mixed martial arts legend Fedor Emelianenko. Um, he has a, to put it mildly, spotty past, um, and has just been released or is set to. I'm not entirely sure if he has been. Has he been released yet or not? He has been released. Yeah. He has been released uh, from prison. Uh, he was serving for a rape sentence uh, and got released several years early, um, and has has voiced his intention to return to mixed martial arts uh, activity at the, you know, before he, I won't say before he went away, but there was a time when Alexander Emelianenko was one of the top heavyweights in the game. That time is well beyond us, but I, uh, I do kind of want your thoughts in general, and then we can get into sort of a, maybe a little bit more specific on Alex's release and return to mixed martial arts. Uh, his release, I think you can already sense how deflated uh, my voice is <laughs> as we open up this topic. I'm uh, not a fan. Not a fan, and I tried to only cover Alexander Emelianenko in news just because I did not have to be biased and, or very biased in general about that or offer opinion, etc. For the main reason that I have very, very strong opinions on this. And let's start with this. Uh, women are not protected in Russian law, not in the slightest, not in the slightest, and nor is it a concern for anything. I mean, I mean, this is this is pure misogyny, and and the, the, the laws in general, and the way it was handled, to be out on good behavior after rape and kidnap, and not even serving what a third of your sentence? Are you kidding me? I, I guess. Hold on one second, because I don't think I really set this up as well as I could have for anybody who's not aware. Um, so for those who aren't aware, Alexander Milianenko was convicted of, uh, of well, as, as Karim said, rape and kidnap um, uh, and forcing narcotics onto a 27-year-old woman um, who I believe was a, an employee of his or a housekeeper. Um, and he basically he forced himself on her, forced drugs into her system, uh, like wouldn't wouldn't allow her to leave the room or something of that nature um, and uh, was sentenced to four and a half years, but then got out three years early. So that's, that's sort of now that I've done a better job of kind of laying the landscape, he only got four and a half years for rape and kidnap and still got out three years early in general. Now that I've laid that out better, kind of explain, I mean, I guess you don't have to explain much, but just sort of go into, yeah, are you kidding me? I can't believe this happened. Well, yeah, I mean, Again, Russian law does not protect women, nor does it, nor does it consider rape a, a crime, a significant crime, from the way they've handled this in general. Either that or he has just one incredible, incredible lawyer. But then again, the Emelianenko name and, and jail, does, doesn't they don't go hand in hand, do they? So you never know who interfered here. I honestly do not have any details beyond the fact that I believe the Russian judicial system is atrocious in general. I mean... Instead, now he's going to be forced to what, complete two years of correctional labor with a 10% deduction of his salary going to the state. I mean, as I was typing the sentences, I was bitter <laughs> about it. So I'm happy I don't have to write opinion pieces. And I'm happy I, if someone asked me to write an opinion piece on why Alexandria Milenko should not come back to mixed martial arts, I refuse to do so. It's not in my interest at all. It's not what I'd like to, to write. The, in the information is right there for everyone to say it because everyone's going to come back to me and say the same thing. Well, do you not think any, anyone is allowed to have a second chance? Emelianenko's not on his second chance. Emelianenko's on his fifth or sixth chance. And God knows what he's done and gotten away with and the intimidation he has used on other women. The fact of the matter is that as soon as this woman started, took him to court, 
his friends had already started calling her, threatening her, threatening her family, and threatening others. I, there are countless other people who he could have hurt. There are other countless other people who are victims to, the, to this horrible trauma and the things that he's capable of doing. This is nothing like his 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 brother Fedor. This is not a person you want to see back in mixed martial arts. And the fact that Fight Night is uh, so willing to immediately, the, the second he was released, immediately state that they'd be interested in, ha in having him fight uh, Antonio Silva, Bigfoot Silva, or any others, is reprehensible at best. I mean, it's it's tough to kind of argue with anything you're saying there. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, when this, when this happened, my initial reaction was... Not so much even in thinking about the specifics of this instance, but kind of sort of broaching a larger topic of conversation in general, which you hinted at in the to what extent should we should we as fans be happy to consume this type of thing? And and as I've become more more aware in general and as I've gotten deeper involved in the sport, it's a question that is is brought up more and more and more because realistically there are a lot of people engaged in the sport and engaged in the sport at a high level that are reprehensible human beings um alexander milenko may be one of the worst if we're if we're being honest about things um the things he is convicted of are heinous his general activity actions are heinous um and and that's saying something considering sort of the context of the sport and they're with with who all has been here, but I have been sort of struggling in general with where, where should we as fans kind of draw the line between another chance and we don't need to support this person with our views, with our dollars, with these sort of things. I think it's, it should be pretty un, un inarguable that Alexander Emelianenko is on the, is on the, bad side of the line like very clearly do not support this man like he's he leveraged the sy system and got out for rape and this is not his this is not the worst thing he's ever done in general um like clearly that's not a guy to support um i did start when greg hardy announced his transition to mma that that's been giving me a lot of kind of pause to think about like yeah, Greg Hardy is just. Do, are you aware who Greg Hardy is? I, just to make sure. I don't follow American football, but I do know of his uh, yeah. of his domestic abuse, uh, his horrible, his horrible cases, particularly like those were uh, yeah. very clear that there's no that there's no other side, like, there's no need for another side, or let's listen to his side or whatnot. I think that was crystal clear what happened that one. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly, and it's. Uh, that's, that's to the extent of how much I know about him, basically. I don't know what he is or how significant he is in American football. Again, I don't know much about the sport. Well, yeah, I, I won't claim to be an expert in uh, professional football, but it's uh, he was an all-pro, and he was one of the best players at his position for several years. We're t dealing with a man who is an athletic marvel, and considering the success, you know, erstwhile NFL players like Matt Mitrion and Brendan Schaub had, if he genuinely can, can like gets a concentrated effort of his time and energy towards it, and considering how like low level heavyweight mixed martial arts is, it is very reasonable to believe that within a few years he will be at a level that the UFC would take interest in him, both for his star power and his ability at actually fighting people. And you know, with the Alex situation and with Greg Hardy. And with a lot of things, I mean, Anthony Johnson has had issues in the past. He's going to be fighting for a title in this upcoming year. Um, Tiago Silva, just numerous ones. And it's, I just kind of would like you to help me figure out where, where we are okay with supporting any of this. Should we, should there be a line? Should we, should it just be a hard and fast rule? Because you know, I do in general believe in second chances. Like, like you said, this isn't, this wouldn't be Alexander's second chance this would be his 30th chance. Um, and I also do believe that there's likely some tangible benefit to having a, a criminal or an abuser or offender have them have a constructive avenue to sort of express themselves, which I believe fighting can be. Um, but I just, it's hard to kind of negotiate that line between 
whether it's okay for people who are accused of violent criminal activity and violent violent activity against women to then sort of transition or continue in an inherently violent sport like mixed martial arts. You sort of get my my I, quandary. I completely understand uh, the dilemma that that that, that you're in and that, that we're trying to contemplate here. And uh, I want to be, I so want to be. Uh, exceptionally reasonable you know and really think this through of course you have to take it case by case in most things right like you ha you yeah. generally you generally have to so it's not fair really to 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 i mean i was just talking yesterday about blanket bans in sports and how that's not going to be a solution so i feel like generalization of things gen doesn't really lead to, to 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 the perfect outcome but it's it's difficult for me not to think and you can you can debate this one with me, but it's difficult for me not to think that if you have been convicted for a violent crime, or if, if, I mean we're talking from domestic abuse, we're talking rape, especially I'm I, it's not just violence against women. There's many other there's many other crimes. Like I think uh, I, can't, I can't remember the guy that I wrote about for World Series of Fight. I forget his name now. The Canadian fighter uh, Ray Ford, Rob Ford. I can't remember his name uh, uh, that, that I wrote about. He had. He broke and enter into into uh, someone's house and tried to. Cut. I'm trying to remember this. So I wrote this about three years ago now, and I believe he either chopped off one of his fingers or threatened to chop off one of his fingers. I mean, all, all these things. And I was talking about how World Series of Fighting's decision to to to, to sign him and to ha have him headline a fight was terrible branding and something they should reconsider. And in general, I'd like to think that if you're convicted of violent crimes, if you're convicted of violent crimes, you should not be allowed to return to a violent sport or sports of a violent nature. It's not like these perfect people are trying to come back and get into the darts championships here. They're trying to come back and step into a cage. And I understand the, the, the concept of forgiveness and them getting back into, into the world. And if a convict is let out and can't survive, they're more likely to go back and resort to a crime. I understand that. But there is nothing out there that says that they have to return to, to mixed martial arts. Absolutely not. Why the violent sport? Why tarnish an already niche sport with... Ooh, 101 reasons to be squeamish about why add to those i don't understand i don't need to, i don't understand why i need to be supportive of a person's return to this sport or a person's decision to move to the sport in the term in the sense of greg hardy greg hardy can go and do a hundred other things i don't understand why does he need to be in mixed martial arts why do i need to be supportive of that you can be supportive of the concept of a second chance which mind you first of all i don't think he's repented second of all he doesn't seem like he, he cares very much but that's from a very mild impression I have of it in the first place. So maybe that's a judgment I shouldn't have, have publicized so so simply and so straightforward like that. But in general, I don't see any reason why they should be in mixed martial arts. It's not like that's the only way to make a living. As a matter of fact, it's one of the worst ways to make a living. Why <laughs> come back to it? I don't see absolutely any reason why I have to be supportive of it or supportive of the decision. If they're not in martial arts, they're in something else. They're going to work. As long as they're able to get a job in something else, I'm not concerned. Second chances go right ahead. Doesn't have to be MMA though. And that, so you're, you're touching on one of the key things and that's, I, I am of a dual nature about this in that in many regard, in many respects, if not most respects, I sort of, I feel the same way that, but I do, I would be remiss not to give some credence to the idea of, of that's already been mentioned, you know, going that there is a tangible benefit to them going out and, and working and doing a thing to keep them from recidivism in general. And I do, I do think that there is also even a little bit more to that idea in, in the context of mixed martial arts. It, it is a violent sport, but you know, uh, in my experience, I mean, hell, in, in the experience of the world at, at large, people put their children into martial arts at an early age because it teaches you discipline and control and, and humility. Like, it teaches you these things. And I, I train jujitsu and, I, you know, and kickboxing. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a child anymore, but I still became significantly better about these things once I started training. And, and you kind of learn. It just there are things get instilled in you through that's not everyday fighting. work. But that's not prize fighting. It's not the same thing. You're not in the business of, of, of selling your fight and of promoting a certain a certain image and you're not profiting off it. Very, very different, I think, to the nature of martial arts in itself, which, I mean, I grew up doing Taekwondo Karate. I do a bit of Jiu-Jitsu now as well when I have the time. And I think martial arts are essential. I see no 
uh, uh, need for prize fighting. I don't see it. I mean, I don't. <laughs> well, I, I, there's definitely not a need in that it's not a, a right to do it, but. I don't know. It's it's a complex issue that I've been struggling with for a while, and I can't. And that's fair. I think I think it's fair, and I think the discussion is there. And I think for those who are going to listen to this segment specifically, that, that we're in the discussion we're having right now, are going to be uh, have mixed uh, opinions on it. I'm sure. But for instance, one of the ones I get a lot when I was when I talk about how reprehensible I find Alex Emilienko is and his potential return to the sport is, well, Mike Tyson did it. I'm like, well. Why are you under the impression that I'm that I was that I accepted that? Put Mike Tyson, yeah. I'm I'm not quite sure why you think that I thought that that was the exception for rape that I was going to be okay with. No, I'm not okay with that. Mike Tyson may have redeemed himself in the public eye in general, but I, for all we know, and I can I have not looked into this too much. For all we know, his victims are still traumatized. I don't I don't know what's happened to his victims. Do you? We don't know what's happened, just in general, because we've seen him, and he could have repented. He could be doing well. For all I know, he could be offering courses, or not courses, or speaking, or etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I really don't know that much, but I know enough to know that his return to the sport at the time, first of all, I was too young, but in general, when I look back on it and I think about it, it's not something that I accept as was the correct decision, or as something that people in general should accept. In fact, I think that people were hypocrites in general when it came to Mike Tyson. It came to a hero and a role model. So in general, I don't think that his he is the exception, or he should be in in, in he, or he his return to to martial after such a such a scandal should have happened. I think that that kind of gets to gets it gets to my big issue is that in many ways I feel feel a bit hypocritical a lot of times in in following and covering this sport and sort of my general personal moral moral stance and the people I that I, I follow and watch and enjoy fighting. And it's, it's a difficult, difficult thing. Um, we have How gone I feel about Khabib and the Kadyrov relationship. When I wrote, Khabib, when I wrote about Khabib for the first time, before I even knew about Kadyrov, I was convinced that this is the person I was going to make Russia MMA a big thing, that this was going to be a person I'm going to be following for a long time. This was going to be worth, worth it. But every time he fights now, there's a little bit of me that's just a little bit heartbroken, a little bit heartbroken on the inside. Like I'm watching something wrong, like something's wrong with what I'm seeing. And it's for a different reason. I understand it's a little off topic again from what we're saying right now, but it's how, it's, it's how I'm relating to what you're feeling in this one, because I think I'm, I'm sort of point blank on this one in general, even Anthony Johnson, I repeatedly state how, how unimpressed I am with people's vocal support for Anthony Johnson. People say, well, he's repented. He has changed, et cetera, et cetera. Look at him now. He, he seems like such a good person. And, oh my God. Have you seen his knockout power or shut up already? We know this already. <laughs> Those are generally the responses I get. Yep. And it's fair. I mean, it's been said. What am I doing? I'm just rehashing the same old things. I get it. I get it. I get it. But at the end of the day, there are people out there who, while you might be tired of hearing these stories, there are people out there who are still suffering from being the victims of these actual stories. And there are people out there who haven't heard the stories and should hear them. Exactly. Uh, that's... That is a great encapsulation of being a fan of this sport, is enjoying the hell out of it while feeling guilty as hell as well. Um, I mean, I can't even see, watch, watch, uh, like, the punches in the same way anymore. Well, the more you read about brain, the brain, brain damage and just how, it, how it's developed over time, and you listen to more and more fighters as they retire and as they change and what they sound like. And I spent some, the more time I spend in Russia, the more I see some of the older like the M1 events were always attended by all sorts of like legends from boxing and from MMA, etc. And I got to meet quite a few and talk to different ones. And I think it really struck me just how slow and lethargic people really seem to be in just their day-to-day -day lives. We're not even talking like post-fight anymore. We're talking 10 years removed from fighting and it's just become so, you know, you, you have to, to watch fighting. You, you have to know that you're watching it despite despite the problems that that could be despite a, a small part of yourself knowing that you know something's a little wrong here something's a little wrong but at the same time it's taught me a lot about concussions taught me a lot about different things and over time i think we can continuously improve the sport and improve upon it and i think it's generally a discussion that people and fighters have a lot more and fans in general have a lot more people like for instance well, i thought it was impressive when, when sergey Khartonov got uh, got knocked out it's not the part that I found impressive, but when he got knocked out and, and it was announced that he had a fight the following month, and I mean, he was blasted in like a 13-second knockout, I remember, and 
uh, when it was announced that he had an upcoming fight in Russia, fans really like hated it. I mean, I remember writing the article, people were like, what, how, how, how can this happen? He shouldn't be fighting. He shouldn't take the time off, etc., etc." I mean, once upon a time, I don't think that was really the main concern or most people would be thinking about that. But it was so significant that Bellator got involved and reminded him that you're under contract. If this happens, you're not fighting again. And he had to cancel the fight. So it saved him at the end of the day. And I'm not saying it's a, there's a correlation between the fans feeling guilty or et cetera, et cetera. But I, I'm already liking MMA's chances with the slight improvements that we're seeing on a gradual, uh, gradual basis. Well, I don't want to bring you down too much, but don't forget that Matt Mitrione had basically the same thing happened. He won the fight, but he was still pretty clearly suffering of some fashion of a concussion and then turned around a month later and fought Ollie Thompson uh, in, in Bellator. So don't yeah. don't go feeling too good about the trajectory we're on. It's still... Uh, I, I generally don't. I was just trying to hush. <laughs> I think everything I say generally... I was going to have the listeners feeling down or feeling like, like they got to sit there and ponder the, like the worst things about the world. So sometimes <laughs> I feel like I have to say something positive or else what the hell is the point of listening to me? <laughs> uh, I am, I'm sorry that we are ending. I took away the happy ending for us. <laughs> we can end on a poor one. This has been uh, tremendously fun for me. Uh, it has been a great conversation. I'm super glad you showed up for it. Please let the people know where they can find your work, where they can find you on social media, plug whatever you've got that's coming up or anything like that. Let, let them know. I've got a lot coming up. I, can't, I mean, I can't even, I'm, I'm working on a piece for Vocative right now. I'm working on a piece for Bleach Report. I've got a, a, a sort of a long magazine feature, my very first one in an actual magazine called Racket Magazine, dealing with uh, uh, Russian corruption in tennis dating back to Boris Yeltsin and how he revolutionized tennis and how at the same time he helped he helped sow the seeds for, for corruption in tennis. So that'll be out sometime in the next few months. You'll be able to buy that uh, magazine that stands all over the place in the, in the United States and abroad. And other than that, you can expect long forms on the likes of Fedor Emelianenko and Jeff Munson, one on the Egyptian Revolution, and quite a few more coming up in the next... Uh, couple of months but mainly if you want to follow my work and you want to follow everything i do and talk about in general even though it's going to mainly depress you you can find me at at zidan sports on twitter thank you jed it's been fantastic i love it when someone can uh, challenge me intellectually and get me talking for 90 minutes like this yeah we did not intend to go 90 minutes but damn sure we did that's better i'm usually going too so i'm glad we i'm trying to get it trying to get it down trying to be better about that um as for me, nice, and I hope the, the listeners in general understand it and uh, digest it and put it to good use somehow. Really, I mean, even if it's just an awareness when you're watching a fight, that's, that's all I ask for. That's the goal: is just raising awareness of this in general. As for me, everybody, uh, you should know by now, but just in case you don't, you can follow me on Twitter at Jed K. Mashu. You can reach out to me uh, an email if you have a question that's longer than 140 characters. Jed Mashu MMA at gmail.com. You can find all my work uh, every day goes up at MMAfighting.com. Um, that is all for this week. I want to again thank you, Cream, for uh, showing up, kind of educating a lot of people on a lot of things. We didn't get to everything I wanted to discuss today either, so we'll have to have you on again real soon. But uh, thank you again, my friend. This was fun. It was my absolute pleasure. I keep, keep doing what you're doing fantastic and it's fantastic that I'm, I'm seeing you here on mma fighting as i'm talking to you about the things i'm doing and i just i can just remember five years ago conversations were very different my friend but it's amazing <laughs> what can happen in five years it really is they were very different indeed it's been great uh thank you